please stand for our opening hymn.
I will give thee for a light to the Gentiles. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through the outpouring of the Holy Ghost didst reveal the way of eternal life to every race and nation, pour out this gift anew, that by the preaching of the gospel thy salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. A reading from Genesis. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and who... And him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The word of the Lord. Psalm 86. Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any deeds like yours. All nations that you have made shall come and worship you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. Indeed, you are God alone. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. O knit my heart to you, that I may fear your name. I will thank you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and will praise your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward me. You have delivered my life from the nethermost pit. A reading from Revelation. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, 
from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. And it's great to be back with you here again today. My name is Chris uh, Royer. I'm the Executive Director of Angleton Frontier Missions. Can you hear me in the back all right? That's good to know. A, a little bit louder. Is The mic is on. There we go. I think it's on. Great. Well, this is my third time back with you all, and it's such a joy to be here. Thank you, Father Eric, for the invitation. Uh, there's a story about a couple in the snow-drenched streets of Chicago wanting to go to South Florida for vacation. The husband got to the hotel one day early. He checked in. The wife was coming. She was on a business trip. When the husband checked in, he wanted to send his wife an email, but he had just got a new laptop, and her email address wasn't on that. She had just got a new email address. So he jogged his memory at the hotel computer, wrote an email, but his address was off by one character. Instead, the email went to a grieving pastor's widow who had just buried her husband one hour before. The email of this man in South Florida to the widow, the pastor's wife, read like this. Dearest wife, just checked in today. Everything's prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Love your dearest husband. P.S. Sure is hot down here. <laughs> a little bit more about that later. For those of you who don't know, I'm a, a child of Generation X, grew up in Boulder, Colorado, in the incredible mountains, hiking, biking in the summertime, skiing every wintertime, basketball all the time. Do the hook on that, the gooseneck. Growing up for me, life was good, life was fun. And when I turned 16 years old, I studied for a test, I went down to the local DMV, passed the test the first time, and I got my what? Freedom. Remember that feeling? 16 years old? Freedom! To go wherever I wanted to go, do what I wanted to do, dream whatever I wanted to dream. 
And in college, God gave me a dream. When I was at Wheaton College, he put the needs of the world on my heart. And so after I graduated with a master's degree, I went to the Middle East to share the good news of Jesus Christ with people, with Muslims living there. But I got blindsided by the unpredictability of the region. 1990, it dates me. 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And I'm in the Middle East, and I see some pictures. This is pre-internet days, pre-cell phone days, so you have to imagine how few pictures we actually saw. But I see that Saddam uh, is crushing the Kurds after they rose up and tried to overthrow him. And so the Kurdish people had to walk for days, some of them weeks, in cold, fierce rain towards the border of northern Iraq, southern Turkey, hoping to find shelter in the mountains. And I turn on the TV with some friend of mine and I see these people need help. These people need the gospel. And this weird uh, confliction of feelings started rising up inside of me. There's this desire to go and help them and to share Jesus with them. But there's also this incredible fear and apprehension, not knowing what would await me as I serve them in those mountains. I grew up in the Colorado mountains, 8,000 feet above sea level. My parents had this beautiful mountain house, and when I went out on the front porch, I could do this, and I had 360 degree views of the Rocky Mountains. Beautiful! But when I went up to those mountains on the Iraqi-Turkey border, the only thing, two things that these eyes saw were piles of human suffering. In my parents, Colorado Rocky Mountain House, they had central heating and a wonderful stone fireplace. It was toasty warm all the time. But the only shelter those Kurds had on those mountains were vinyl tents with holes and the wind and the rain was going through them all the time. In the Colorado mountains, when I went and did a bike ride or I went skiing, I'd come home and turn on the faucet and warm, hot, Water, standing in the shower, that feeling of just getting cleansed and, and meditating in hot water. But the only water these two, these Kurdish people had was half a mile away, and they had to carry it by hand. Their exercise was exercise for survival. And I'll be honest with you, church, the longer that I stayed in those mountains, the more hopeless, the more despondent, I became. I'm trying to serve them with anything, everything that I have, with love and prayers and just the ministry of presence. But the longer I stayed there, the longer I, the longer and the deeper I got depressed. When I was in college, I had dreams for my life, things I wanted to do with my life. But I'm looking into the eyes of, of dozens of college age Iraqi Kurds every day, and they don't even know that they can dream for their life. They've got no dreams. Because the world in which they live is a ferocious, brutal place. And they're enslaved, not free, but enslaved to their culture and to their hatred for one man, Saddam Hussein. The longer I stayed there, the more difficult it was. And, 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 and as I was there, it hit me one day. This is the reality for much of the world, not just Kurds in Iraq, but in Sudan, in Syria, in Bangladesh. In Jordan, you go across the globe. The world is full of hopeless and hurting, broken and bruised people. So what can I do? What can you do? Jesus taught about this thing called hell. Do you know that? Do you know that Jesus taught about hell? I think you do because Father Eric preaches from the scriptures. And the scriptures talk about heaven and hell. In the book of Revelation, where we read about the peoples and the tribes worshiping Jesus, we also read a little bit later in chapter 20 about heaven and hell. In chapter 20 of Revelations, it says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet who had been thrown there, they will be tormented day and night. Revelation 20, 10. Now, when I think about the devil being tormented in hell forever, guess what? I don't feel that bad, Graham. I feel like, wow, 
the struggle of my life, the temptations, the stress, the, 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 all the stuff that I deal with as a human being living in this broken and, and crazy world, that will be gone, that will be buried. I don't feel bad about him, but, but as we read Revelation chapter 20, a few verses later, it says this, and anyone whose name is not written in the book of life is cast into hell. So, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've taken yourself off the throne of your life, if you said, Jesus, I'm all in with you, then you're okay. But if you don't follow or believe in Jesus, cast into hell. For some of us, maybe watching online, that might not feel quite right. It might be a little muddled or confusing. So let's try to talk through this right now and clear up some of the misunderstandings. I used to live in Boulder, Colorado, beautiful place. I also used to live in Bluffton, South Carolina, another beautiful place, right across from Hilton Head Island. Beautiful sandy beaches, uh, marshes, fishing, swimming, oysters, lobsters, crabs, just an incredible place to live, South Carolina. One of the most beautiful places in the world, in my opinion. But as I was a pastor there for many years, I also noticed that people were downright miserable in one of the most beautiful places in the world. Marriages fell apart there. People were addicted to drugs and alcohol and all other sorts of things there. Kids dropped out of school there. There were problems in the community there. And it hit me, you can be downright miserable even though you live in most one of the most physically beautiful places in the world and just the opposite is true you can be living in one of the most dreadful physically horrific places on the globe and yet be experiencing a slice of heaven like my friend dan bauman dan went to wheaton with me afterwards he went to iran he was sharing the gospel in iran he got arrested and these concocted, made-up charges were, were thrust upon him, and they said he was spying for the CIA. And he spent 61 days of his life in one of the worst places in the globe, Evan Prison, Iran, in solitary confinement. And yet he wrote in his book, I felt as if God's hands were underneath me in the midst of that experience. I felt like Jesus was with me. Or Corrie Ten Boom, remember Corrie Ten Boom? Nazi German concentration camps. She said, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. And it hit me. This is the light bulb that went on in my mind at those uh, refugee camps on top of that mountain in northern Iraq. That God wants to use me and his people to bring heaven into hell-like conditions. God wants to use us to bring heaven into hell-like conditions. How? By changing one life at a time. One life at a time. You all, I think, know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This verse speaks to eternal life or heaven as a condition, not so much a destination, not so much a location, but a condition of living your life with the presence of God flowing inside of you, from you, to you, all around you. And hell is just the opposite. It's the condition of living your life apart from Jesus' loving presence which flows in us and ministers to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus did not come to push people aside. Jesus didn't come to thrust us away. Jesus didn't come to point fingers and saying, you're not good enough, you're going to hell. No, Jesus came because this world is messed up, because there are so many hell-like conditions on the globe as it is right now. Hello? The world is not a good place. And I think in America, the last 12 months have been like any other 12 months that I've lived in and probably most of us have lived in in the United States of America. Social strife, turmoil, looting, violence, polarization, 
And it feels like the foundations of this country are crumbling before our very eyes. And God sees the plight of his people, of his children who accept him. And he sees the plight of people who have not accepted him. And he looks down and he says, what can I do? How can I help them? What can I do to save them? So he says, I have an idea. I'll send this guy named Noah. And through Noah, I'll have a do-over and I'll start this great nation through him. Except for after the flood, remember what happens? Noah gets drunk. It breaks the father's heart. So God the father says, I know what I'll do. I'll send Abram, I'll start a nation out of him, and through him I'm going to bring heaven-like conditions into this place called planet Earth. But the children of Israel again and again and again turn their back on God. And so at the end, the father says, I know what I'll do. I'll send my son. Surely they'll listen to my son. And the evil of the world crushes and crucifies Jesus. If there was a fire in this church, God forbid, and, and firemen had to come, and if firemen saved most of us, but weren't able to save each and every one of us, would we bl blame the firemen for the fire? Uh-uh. We'd say, thank you so much for risking your life for saving me. Our God is a fireman, and the world's on fire. And he's called each and every one of us as rescue agents to do something, something, anything about the plight of the world. And I don't know about you all, when this challenge, when this realization hits you, when it hit me, it challenged me. It caused me to spend almost two decades of my life in the Middle East because the state and the cursedness and the lostness of the world so gripped me that I felt I had to do something. You see, friends, when you really get the state of the world and what God's word has to say about the world, you'll do one of two things. You'll say, I'm all in. Here I am, Father, send me. Or nope, it's not my battle. It's not my fight. Here's the deal. The enemy doesn't want us to believe in hell. Why? Because Jesus crushed hell when he died on the cross. The enemy thinks it's bad enough that we are, that heaven is inside of us, that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. He wants us to stay here in this church and in our homes and not tell a soul. He wants us to be quiet. But if hell and heaven do not exist, then why did Jesus have to die on the cross? And if his death on the cross has no meaning, then our salvation has no meaning. And if our salvation has no meaning, then coming to church has no meaning. Gathering here has no meaning. Heaven and hell are real. And here's the deal, church. The most hell-like conditions on the globe, the, most, the places on the earth with the worst poverty, with unclean water, with the worst sexual trafficking, with floods, with droughts, with you name it, the places that no one would want to live, those are the places, generally speaking, where the church is not, where the gospel is not. Those are the places where we have frontier peoples living. Say that phrase with me, frontier peoples. Frontier peoples, 5,000 ethno-linguistic people groups, 0.01% Christian presence or less. Basically, there's no access to church or Christians or Bibles or bishops or pastors or priests. You can't find a church even if you want to. And those are the places on the globe that are mired in hell-like conditions. And so when people say to me, Chris, Father Chris, how can a loving God allow people like those Kurds up on the mountain who's never had a missionary, never had a church, because Bibles have never been translated in their language, how can a loving God allow them to go to hell? I respond, how can you and me, the people of God, allow them and so many others to remain in hell-like conditions. How? Jesus Christ crucified on the cross defeated all the powers of death and darkness and hell. And when his disciples got it, they were slow. They were very slow. But when they got it, they said, this is something that we can give our lives for. And this is something on World Mission Sunday that the Father calls us again to give our lives for. And so the question before all of us is, what do you have? What can you give? What can you do? 
Well, brothers and sisters, if you have a heart, then pray. Pray for this country. Pray for the world. If you don't know how to pray, sign up on our sheet at the table back there. We'll send you prayer requests to pray for places and peoples where the church is not. If you have a heart, you can pray. If you have a mind, you can grow. Grow, grow. Learn about what God is doing in this world. This is actually a very difficult time, but this is a time where the gospel is spreading and where doors are falling down and windows are opening to the gospel in places, especially where there's never been a church. If you have a mind, you can grow. If you have a mouth, talk, talk, talk the gospel. This is the time for us followers of Jesus to share the good news that Jesus died to, to crush the powers and the forces against us. If we do not open our mouths as believers in this country, Christianity will slowly be extinguished in this country. God is calling each and every one of us. And, and you can figure out how. There's plenty of creative ways to share the gospel. But if you have a mouth, open your mouth and talk, whether online or face to face. So if you have a heart, you can pray. If you have a mind, you can grow. If you have a mouth, you can talk. And if you've got two feet to walk with, you can go. We read the passage in Genesis. Abram left it all. Abram left it all to follow God. The 12 disciples eventually launched out of Jerusalem. The Father in his goodness is constantly calling brothers and sisters to go to places that are hard and difficult where they cannot really conceptualize with their eyes what it's about, but yet he calls us to step out in faith. And missions overseas cross-culturally knows no age. If you have two feet to walk with, you can grow. Pray. Grow, talk, and go. Last century, there was a famous violinist. My girls both play violin. And um, there's this violinist named Chris, Fritz Chrysler. And he was a generous man. He gave most of his money away. But one day he heard about this collector's violin for sale. And he was envious. And he wanted it. But he didn't have enough money, so he started playing like crazy, lots of concerts to save up money to go buy it. When he had enough money, he thought to buy it. He went to the collector only to hear that it had been sold. So he went to the new owner, and the owner said, nope, not for sale. But he had an idea. He said to the collector, can I play that violin just once? The collector said, sure. Chrysler went, he opened the case, he tightened the strings, tuned it, rosined the bow, and he started playing this heavenly music, so beautiful that the new collector, the new owner, just bawled. He broke down in tears. And as Chrysler was putting away the violin, the new collector, crying still, said to Chrysler, this is too precious for me to keep all to myself. Take it. Play it but let all the world hear. Brothers and sisters at All Saints, we have something so much more precious than a wooden violin. We have the treasure of God inside these vessels of clay. Take it, play it, for all the world to hear. Because Jesus' commission uttered 2,000 years ago is still valid today. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all that I have commanded you. And as you go, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. Father in heaven, I just thank you so much for this very missional church. I thank you for All Saints partnership with Anglican Frontier Missions and the, the blessing that we have through this church. Father, I pray you bless this church with more missional zeal, more evangelistic fervor to be sharing the gospel far and wide across the globe and especially right here in Springfield. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty and powerful name.
stand. <clears throat> and continuing on page seven, let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things are made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate from the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen.
Grant these our prayers, O Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear what comfortable words our Savior Christ saith unto all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hear also what St. Paul saith, This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John saith, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. You may be seated. Well, hello and welcome to All Saints. If you are new or visiting with us today, we are very excited to have you with us. If you'd like more information on All Saints or if you would like for us to contact you this coming week, please fill out one of the welcome cards in the pew rack in front of you, and then you can hand that to me on your way out or you can drop it in the collection plate as you go and we will be in touch with you. And please know that all baptized Christians who come to faith and repentance in Jesus Christ are invited to receive Holy Communion today. I'd like to thank Chris Royer for being here with us today. It's always nice to have a real live missionary here with us on World Mission Sunday. Now, technically, I was a, uh, for a number of years, I was a Nigerian missionary to the United States, but my wife says that didn't count. Um, so it's great to have Chris here. If you'd like to know more about Anglican Frontier Missions and how you can be more involved with Anglican Frontier Missions, Chris has a booth set up in the narthex and he'll be there following the service and can answer any of your questions. And now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God.
we stand. <laughs> Thine, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. All things come of thee, O Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who in the substance of our mortal flesh manifested forth his glory, that he might bring us out of darkness into his own glorious light. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and singing. Holy and gracious Father, in thine infinite love, thou didst make us for thyself. And when we had sinned against thee and become subject to evil and death, thou of thy tender mercy didst send thine only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to thy will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to thy right hand in glory, that we might come boldly under the throne of grace. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks unto thee, he brake it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks unto thee, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. With these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, sanctify them, we beseech thee, by thy word and Holy Spirit, that they may be for thy people the body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under thy Christ and bring us with all thy saints into the joy of thy heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through thy Son, Jesus Christ, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Paschal Lamb, has been offered up for us once for all upon the cross. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, O Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of Thy Son and heirs of Thine eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work Thou hast given us to do, to love and serve Thee as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to whom with Thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.